Comrade Chair, comrades, brothers and sisters, I think it's tremendous that we got this kind of turnout tonight, especially from young people interested in the history of the labor movement. Because there are different kinds of landmarks in the struggles of the working class. Some of them have been defeats, like the miners' strike of the 1980s, but nevertheless, a very important page in working class and labor history. But what we are celebrating here tonight is not just saluting those uh, heroic labor councillors who stood up against the powers that be at that stage, mobilized working people like our comrades in Liverpool in the 1980s, <coughs> and defeated the government at that particular time and came out with the immortal slogan, which all workers will turn towards in the period that is now opening up, that it's better to break the law, particularly an unjust law, a capitalist law against working people, than to break the law. <coughs> it's a very simple aphorism, if you like, but one upon, upon which the labor movement has been built. And this movement, 90 years ago, inspired the Clay Cross councillors that we were involved with in the 1970s who refused to put up rents and went to jail. It had the effect in our struggle in Liverpool as well. And in a very good article in the current issue of The Socialist by Pete Dickinson and in the excellent introduction by Vic here tonight, we have a little flavour of the difference in the methods that were employed by the pioneers in this borough, in Liverpool and elsewhere, and unfortunately, the policies that are pursued by the so-called official leaders of the labor movement in Britain at the present time. And there is an uncanny resemblance between the way that that struggle developed 19 years ago. I familiarized myself by reading this excellent book by Noreen Branson on the popular struggle, and there was amazing similarities between that and Liverpool. As Tony has explained, in the 1980s, the Liverpool working class faced a jobs holocaust, faced the collapse of industry. Out of this struggle came the change in the labor movement. The same thing in the aftermath of the First World War with the slump that developed in the aftermath of the First World War. And believe you me, it was not easy in either of these cases for working class representatives to stand up and to give a lead. Because just as at this moment in time, against the background of mass unemployment, of the destruction of the hopes of a new generation, <clears throat> because that's what, <clears throat> in effect, is taking place, the people who were in power tried to create the impression, as is done today, that nothing can be done. At the moment, if you look at the press, the situation is terrible, it's hopeless, they're going around whipping up gloom that nothing can be done by working people. Mm. George Lansbury defied that and his comrades in this borough. The Liverpool 47 de 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 defied that. They produced courageous leaders. And by the way, what a contrast between Lansbury's supporters and members and the present leadership of the Labour Party. Mm. We have three representatives of the three main parties today that has not, have not done a hand's turn in their life. They haven't done a proper job, if you want to use that particular phrase. They come from university, being picked up as officials in the trade unions on a rather comfortable life, or in the case of Cameron, from a comfortable position into university and so on. Who are the people who led the popular struggle? They were dockers. They were building workers. They were ordinary working class women who rose to the needs of the situation and led working people in struggle as well. And moreover, the crucial role of working class people in action. Never forget this and absorb that one lesson which is vital in the next period. If working people <coughs> are given a lead, they are prepared to struggle, particularly in the kind of social situation that we have at this particular moment in time. As Tony pointed out, we organized two general strikes. The, the movement in Liverpool was thwarted 
was thrown back by the intervention primarily of Neil Kinney, the right-wing leader of the Labour Party at that stage. And again, there's a similarity there. In the battle of George Lansbury, he was not only fighting the government, he was fighting the official leadership of the movement as well. Herbert Morrison in the neighbouring borough of Hackney, who was opposed to unconstitutional action, just as Kinney was opposed to going outside the law, so-called, at the present time. That movement in Liverpool inspired our struggle in the poll tax movement, which, remember, defeated Thatcher. We were told at the beginning of that struggle, you will not succeed. Thatcher defeated the miners. Thatcher defeated Galti Eri in Argentina. You will not win. We said, but did you know that there were a million workers in Scotland who were not paying the poll tax? We didn't. And by the propaganda of the deed, with no support from the tops of the labour movement. The poll tax was defeated, not by Neil Kinnock, not by little left groups on the outskirts of the labour movement, but was defeated by the militant, now the Socialist Party, with people like Tony Mulhern that went to the end in the struggle. 34 people were jailed, ordinary working men and women, women, but we broke the poll tax and we broke Thatcher. And nothing can erase that from the history of the working class and the labour movement. Contrast Tony Mulhern and George Lansbury to Ed Miliband. Now he's called Ed Moribond <laughs> after his performance in Liverpool. Contrast that with the way that even at the time the right wing couldn't attack the popular council openly, and yet Ed Miliband, as Tony pointed out, opened the conference of the Labour Party not in attacking the enemy, of attacking the capitalists, contrary to what has been said, but opened up by saying it's great to be in Liverpool, Labour Liverpool, a generation ago, a Labour leader that was Kinnock, who sneaked into the conference, as Tony explained, came to conference to, to condemn the behaviour of a Labour council in Liverpool. Today I come to Liverpool proud to hold our conference in this great city. Proud of the work our Labour council is doing, which is what? to carry through cuts. You're talking about a Labour Council? We have a comrade here who's come from Waltham Forest Council tonight where the Labour, the Labour Council has issued redundancy notices. That's something they accused us of to the workforce in that borough, sacking a lot of them, proposing that, and then re-employing re them on rates of, of a, a big cut in the, in the wages of those workers itself. Comrades, this is a period today like 1921, that is crying out for a lead. We've had the riots in the last couple of months, and despite their attempt to try and say this was the, the cause of this was criminality, it was only seven, eight weeks ago, that, that analysis doesn't hold any water because now it's quite clear. It arises from the crisis of the system. Even Miliband at the conference, at one stage, his, his left eyebrow flickered and went up, and suddenly the press said he's attacking capitalism. And unbelievably, unbelievably, and he stepped a little bit towards the left, and the roof threatened to fall in, as far as the capitalists were concerned. The Sun actually said, it's a scandal, because the Labour leader was suggesting that mo the modern capitalist system was a failure. <laughs> By the way, it's not just the Labour leader, this is in the, in the Observer. The ailing euro is part of a wider crisis. Our capitalist system is near meltdown. And unfortunately, if only it would have come out with a real analysis of the crisis of capitalism and an alternative, then you would have had at least some glimmer of hope coming out of that conference. Uh. This is a system that is faced with a profound crisis. Suzanne has given a very good picture here tonight of the terrible situation of unemployment. Yes. Think about the figures, and I would particularly say to the new generation who are here tonight, think about your future and the future of your generation on the basis of this system. Because working people haven't moved in Britain, apart from a, a few sections yet, partly because of the severity of this crisis, where they're stunned, partly because they're hoping against hope that this will be a temporary crisis mm -hmm and we will escape from it in the future. But listen to what the experts of capitalism say. The number unemployed at the present time, 
Throughout the advanced industrial countries is 40 million. 20 million working men and women. A huge section of that of young people whose hopes are being ground into the dust on the basis of this system. You have figures which are absolutely horrendous. I cannot give all of them. Where, for instance, in uh, Madrid, in, in the, 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 the number of unemployed in Spain represents the total population of the two major cities of Madrid and Barcelona. And is there any, uh, any uh, hope that you can escape from this? But Miliband said at one stage, he actually said on Newsnight last night, well, I am a socialist. But then he said, but I accept capitalism. You cannot ride two horses here. He also said in an interview in the last day, he said, well, um, I'm against being pictured as uh, an extremist, a socialist, and so on. We have to win the, the conservatives, and there's nothing wrong with that of workers who voted conservative or liberal in the last election or before, but they are being radicalized by the blows that are struck to their hopes <coughs> by capitalism. At precisely this moment, when this system is, is in its greatest danger, we have Miliband riding to the uh, rescue, if you like, of the capitalist system itself. This is a system that's based upon production for profit, which Marx called the unpaid labor of the working class and not of social need. There's no possibility, as Miliband promised, that you can have increased equality yeah. in the future. The system is founded on the exploitation of the working class. Right. In the very act of employing workers, and workers only get back a certain <coughs> part of the product that they produce, from that flows the inequalities of capitalism, which is woven into the system itself. Anybody who, pleased, who believes that you can have a better capitalism, that you can have a less amoral capitalism, only had to look at YouTube, look at the BBC yesterday, and see that trader, that hedge fund trader, and what was his philosophy? His philosophy was, I'm hoping for a new recession, because we can make a pile of lolly out of this recession. With the fact that that destroys the hopes and the jobs of working class people was absolutely secondary as far as that is concerned. And where did this crisis come from? Well, Ed Balls at the conference said we didn't see this coming. The Queen at one stage went to the London School of Economics and asked all the economists who were present, please tell me, why didn't you see this coming? There were 13,000 economists in the US alone and they didn't see this coming. But well, we saw it was coming. If you look at the material of the Socialist Party, we saw that a crisis was brewing because the system is now not based upon the production of real value, where manufacturing industry has collapsed, but on a huge house of cards of financialization of what Marx called fictitious capital that came crashing to the ground yeah. in 2007. And what is going to put this system back on its feet? Well, if the working class accepts <coughs> the attacks of capitalism, maybe in time, over a long period of time, that could happen. But the experts of the system, not Peter Tapp or Tony Moran, or socialists who are here tonight, but the experts are saying this is the worst crisis in 60, 70, <coughs> one of them said in 100 years. And what's their solution? Austerity and more austerity. To give it its right name, it's planned poverty. And not just of the working class. But as we see in Greece, it's poverty of working class people as well. And in Greece, we see that the working class are not prepared to bend the knee and accept these attacks on their living standards. They've organized 10 general strikes. You could have eliminated capitalism in Greece three or four <coughs> times over if the leaders of the movement would have been equal to the determination of working class people. Look at the situation in Greece today. I saw one terrible phrase, the death of hope in the future, of suicides doubling. On news night last night of the middle class, like Germany in 1923, thrown into the abyss of despair and poverty. And what is the solution of the European uh, community, so-called, of the ECB, of the European Bank, but more of the same, with 200% debt on sovereign debt of 200% of its GDP, and yet they're prepared to carry out further cuts. And where are the leaders of the working class and the trade union movement 
in Greece. Well, as our comrade said to me, the first demonstration, the leaders were on a stage about as high as that ceiling there. Mm -hmm. And the workers were so indignant at them not being prepared to carry through a struggle that they tried to storm the platform. So the next demonstration, it was twice as high. And after the 10th general strike, they were speaking from the top of the Eiffel Tower. And still the working class tried to get at them because of the indignation that they felt at this situation. And it's not just in Greece, it's here as well. There was an open session at the conference of the Labour Party. I thought that all our comrades would turn up where Ed Miliband was going to meet the public. And we were suggesting that they should come along to that meeting, to this open meeting, and say, right, Ed, you know, you've been proved to be wrong, we want to become, come back into the Labour Party. Now, that would have been a terrible nightmare, as a matter of fact, for most of the 47. But it t demonstrates that the Labour Party is not open, is not capable on the basis of what happened in the speeches of the leadership and what happened in the conference itself. But anybody who looks at the struggle and the cuts now, and it's getting serious now, 240 thousand workers in the public sector have been made redundant. It's a terrible fact in Britain. As added to the huge unemployment of two and a half million, 80,000 increased unemployment in the last three months. And they are largely people without faith, without hope, disappointed that there can be a successful struggle against the cuts. But what's left are people who now see if they don't fight in this situation, they could lose their job and they may <laughs> never work again. Or if they let this service go, for instance, the attacks on women, that will never come back if the leaders of this system actually get their way. And therefore, a harder movement is developing now, a harder mood, reflected in March the 26th. And by the way, that demonstration did not drop from the sky. That was the product of the pressure from below of the National Shop Stewards Network of members of the Socialist Party and other workers in the trade unions who were, were putting pressure on the TUC to call such a demonstration. And what happened? The trade union leaders lifted their little finger and we had the biggest, specifically, working class demonstration, certainly, if you like, for 100 years, and probably the biggest since the monster meetings and demonstrations of the Charters at the beginning of the 19th century itself. And that, by the way, was achieved with a weakened trade union movement. The present membership of the trade union is half of what it was in the 1970s, <coughs> six million workers. But it's the most colossal, potentially powerful weapon in society at the present time that, complete, that can completely change the situation. So therefore, November the 30th is a crucial time for the working class in Britain. We haven't had a general strike in Britain, not even a one-day strike, since 1926. If three million workers come out on strike, and it's very difficult to see how the government is going to avoid it, if they come out on one day, that will be bigger even than the 1926 general strike. Because that general strike was over nine days, it was a rolling strike, and there was never more than about 1.7 million who were on strike at any one time during the course of that movement. If the government does a U-turn and retreats and gives concessions to the local government workers, that will not disarm the movement, that will force the other workers to come onto the scene and fight for their demands in this situation. So it's crucial that November the 30th, following from Poplar, following from Liverpool, the maximum power of working people is mobilised in this action. And as with all real struggles of the working class, where they come out and show their power, they mobilize from below the middle layers of society, the discontented middle class, the so-called squeezed middle, who will be affected by this movement. British society, once you have a movement of this character, will never be the same again. But it will mean also that promoted from the ranks of this movement, this time has to be Real fighters, real strugglers, people who are prepared to go to the end like Tony Mulhern. He's too modest to mention this. But we and him suffered through the persecution of the 47 by the capitalist state, 
but also by the agents of capitalism with inside the labour movement as well. Mm. They produced a kind of uh, nuclear winter within the labour movement, which has gone way towards the right. Anybody who saw Blair on the television earlier this week, this multi-millionaire, and then Kenneth, he's finally come to power, by the way. He was defeated in Britain, but his uh, daughter-in-law has finally come to power as the Prime Minister in Denmark in the election last uh, Sunday. Right. But I can predict this. It will be disaster for working people. They will not be carried through a change in the situation. So therefore, comrades, it's not sufficient. And what a comment, by the way, on, a, on the hallowed leadership of the Labour Party, that when Ed Balls mentioned he wasn't Tony Blair, the biggest cheer of the conference and the biggest boo, it was like appearing at a Saturday morning cinema when I was a kid and the villain came on. There was booing in the conference itself, which was an embarrassment to the leadership itself. We have to prepare a tremendous movement in the next period. We had this young fellow who came up and said his family had been saved by the welfare first aid. And I thought, well, there's a bit of life in the Labour Party. He's a young guy of 16. And then we find in the press today and yesterday, this young 16-year-old was the son of a property developer. He said his home was repossessed, but his father had obviously repossessed homes and was in private school until his father could no longer afford it. And this was put forward as the youth fighting for a new future. I prefer Suzanne Beesham and the youth fight for jobs than those little bureaucrats who have been schooled within the official organisations of the labour movement at this stage. And what did that ball say? He said, keep the Tory cuts. That's enough. What did Miliband say? He said, we cannot touch the anti-trade union laws that were passed by Thatcher. That's enough, by the way, for the trade unions to say. That party does not reflect working class people today. So what is the alternative? The alternative is a new system. It won't come out of the sky. It'll come out of the kind of struggles that are developing now. Capitalism, when it faces the power of the working class, as in 1921, as in the, the 1980s in Liverpool, they will retreat. Sometimes they will give a lot more than they can actually afford. But that's not our problem. We fight for reforms. Reforms, if you like, are a byproduct of radical and revolutionary struggle. But where we differ from the reformists is we recognize no reform is permanent within the confines of capitalism that we'll give with the left hand and take back with the right hand tomorrow. And that's why we raise the question of socialism. Not of the caricature of socialism in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union with a one-party totalitarian regime. That's impossible in a highly democratic and with a cultured working class as we have in Britain. No, we're talking about democratic socialism, of the involvement of working people and not the bureaucracy in managing and organizing the resources of society. Why are factories idle? Why are the tens of thousands of billion wielding workers out on the stones at the present time? Why are young people not being employed, a million of them, are not being employed in apprenticeship? It's easier to get into Oxford and to get an apprenticeship according to The Guardian in the last period. That arises from a system that's based upon the production for profit and not of social need. Socialism means the planned use of the resources for the many and not the few. If we do not have this, we can have the future of endless poverty. At the very best, even the capitalist experts are saying we'll have stagnation for the foreseeable future. We reject that. Liverpool rejected that. Poplar rejected that, forward to a massive display of working class power on November the 30th. If the government undertakes a U-turn, all well and good, it won't stop the movement. We then have to say, we're not just satisfied with you retreating, we want the real wealth of Britain. We don't just want a piece of cake, we want the bakery, is an old slogan of the labour movement itself. This is the only way and the means of, of achieving that is to build the forces of socialism of the Socialist Party. Without us in Liverpool, there would have been no struggle. Without George Lansbury in a coalition of other radicals, there would not have been the struggle. Leadership is crucial, and working people will give confidence to leaders so long as they're not fakes, so long as they're not prepared 
to go halfway along and then retreat. So long as they're prepared to go to the end in a struggle with working people, then we will get their support. We want to build the Socialist Party, but we also want to build a new mass party of the working class that can act, as Tony pointed out, as a beacon for all sections of working people in the struggle that is opening up to defeat this government, to defeat capitalism, and to establish a socialist, democratic, planned organization of society.